Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you to open up to Romans chapter 12. If you've been coming around a while, you may remember, recall, or notice that we often project the words of the passage that we're looking at on the screen. We're kind of moving away from that. I've been thinking a little bit about what does it mean for us to engage with the scriptures as we come in and out of here. And I think there's something really important and significant about looking at it in your lap, whether it's on your phone or in a Bible. And so um, just encourage you to open up a Bible and, you know, hold some old school pages and paper in your hands this morning. Um, So there's this scene in The Empire Strikes Back where Luke is training with Yoda. Luke is a a young Jedi at this point, and he needs training in order to be able to really hone in the force. And in the beginning of Empire Strikes Back, he is told by Obi-Wan Kenobi in a vision to go to Dagobah to find this Jedi master named Yoda, and he will teach him what it means to be a Jedi and hone the force. And so he goes to Dagobah to find this mysterious character, and as he goes... And he lands in Dagobah, he crashes his X-Wing fighter plane. And it's kind of, Dagobah is kind of this swampy, creepy, dark planet. And so he's not really sure what to do or where to go, but he crashes and he goes in on search for Yoda, and eventually he finds Yoda. And Yoda is going to train him how to use the Force. And so there's one day where he's training young Skywalker, and they're by the swamp where he crashed his swing. And uh, Yoda has Luke balancing on his hands, doing a handstand. On one hand, he's balancing Yoda on one foot, and he's moving rocks and stacking them on top of each other with the force. He's doing all of this, trying to gain his focus. And as he's doing that, his X-wing like is partially in the water, and then it goes all the way under And Luke gets frustrated, he gets distracted, he falls over, he walks to the edge of the swamp, and he goes, I'll never be able to get it out now. And Yoda, in his like squeaky little Kermit the Frog voice, in his kind of awkwardly worded sentences, says, always with you what cannot be done. Meaning you're always focusing on the negative. You're always focusing on how things are in decline. And Luke responds saying, well, moving stones is one thing, but this is different. And Yoda like yells at him and he goes, no, it's not. It's only different, he says, in your mind. He says, you have to unlearn what you have learned. Essentially, he's saying to him, you have to think differently. And so Luke goes to the edge of the swamp. He says, okay, I'll give it a try. He tries to use the force to move his X-wing out of the swamp, but he can't do it. He's defeated. He's deflated. He's like, it's just too big. And he walks away and he kind of collapses to the ground. And then Yoda slowly, calmly moves to the edge of the swamp. And he just kind of closes his eyes. He sticks out his hand and he uses the force. And he lifts this X-wing out of the swamp. He moves it through the air and sets it down right in front of Luke Skywalker. And his mind is blown. And he goes over to Yoda and he says, I can't believe it. Like, I can't believe that you could do this. And Yoda calmly looks him square in the eyes and he says, that is why you failed. That is why you failed. Essentially, you failed not because you weren't putting in the effort. It wasn't because of lack of effort, but you failed because of your thinking, because of your mindset. Psychologists and educators have two words for what's happening in this scene in The Empire Strikes Back. Those two words are a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Any teachers here use that with their kids? Like, do you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Yeah. We think about that all, all the time, w- whether we actually use those terms or not. We, we use this idea. And what, what, what's happening in this scene is Luke has a fixed mindset. He's thinking, I can't do this. And Yoda is trying to show him, no, it's capable. All you need is a growth mindset. A growth mindset is basically that it's this belief that your abilities and your skill can grow over time 
if you have the right mindset. But a fixed mindset is that there's a cap on your skill and your ability, and someday you're going to hit that ceiling, and you're just going to have to deal with it, live with it, accept that reality. And so therefore, the overall success of an individual in this paradigm, again, is less about your ability, and it's all about your thinking, your mindset, the way you perceive the world. And so the question for us this morning is where in your life do you have a fixed mindset? Specifically, in your spiritual life. Where in your spiritual life do you have a fixed mindset where you think to yourself, I can't grow beyond where I am today. My, my circumstances in life are never going to change, so therefore I just have to accept this reality and just learn how to deal with it. M meaning, where is God inviting you into something? Where is God trying to stretch you in certain ways in your faith and in engaging in his mission? And your immediate response is, I can't. There's no way that I could do that. See, the assumption of the scriptures is that God is looking for your participation in his mission in the world. And sometimes God is going to call us to things that seem beyond our capacity. There are times that God is going to call us into things that seem scary and uncertain. But the other assumption of the scriptures is that when God calls you into something, he also equips you for what you need, with what you need, to do the thing that he's calling you to do. And so the question is, where is your thinking hindering you from engaging with God? What we're, what we're going to explore this morning is that fully engaging with God, fully engaging in God's calling, fully engaging in God's mission starts with your thinking. It's all about how you think about who you are in light of who God is and what God is doing and has done and how he might be leading you. And so where do you need to think differently about what God is doing in your life? So we're crossing into a new section in Romans. We're crossing into a section that goes Romans 12 through the end of the book through Romans 16. And Paul starts this new section focusing on this idea of our thinking. This is how it begins. This is Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed, he's saying, through the process of thinking differently about your world. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We looked at these two verses last week in depth, so go back and view that sermon from last week if you want to catch up what Paul is saying with these two, ser these two verses. Uh, today we're moving into verse 3 through 8, and Paul is saying engaging in God's calling starts with your thinking. It starts with renewing your mind. And as you cross into verse 3, he makes it even that much more explicit. He says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, one of the objectives when we read this scripture is we read for the sake of meaning. Like, what does Paul mean? What is he trying to say? And we read for the sake of application. How does this actually make sense in my everyday life? We read for meaning and application. And so we're looking for clues in the text to help uncover meaning and application. And one of the simple clues that the Bible gives us to understand what it means are repeated words in a given verse or passage. And in verse 3, the word think 
is used four times. Let's see if you can find it. Four times. We're going to read it again. This is verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, if you're really paying attention, you're like, Brian, I saw the word think twice. You're saying it's there four times. I only see it twice. You obviously need to do a better job with counting, right? Well, when you read it in English, it gets translated, think, gets translated twice, but it's actually there in Greek four times. We're going to get a little nerdy. Are you ready for this? Like, I'm really, I've been thinking about this all week. I am so excited to share this with you. You have no idea. So here is this verse in Greek. Like the Bible, right? The New Testament was written in Greek. And the four bold and underlined words is the word think in Greek, which is the word phronane. Everybody say phronane. Phronane. You think of somebody who's got a fro, like an afro, phronane, right? Phronane. And so what you have is the two middle words that are bold are the straight word phronane to think. What Paul has done with the words, the first word and the fourth word, he has attached another word to the fro- word phronane to make like a compound word, right? If we remember compound words, bringing, am I saying that correctly, English majors? Bringing two words together to make a new word. So the first word is huper phronane, and huper is a uh, preposition that means above. So it would be thinking above, right, which gets translated, think too highly of ourselves. The second word, or especially the fourth word, is so phronane, and the word so is sound or safe. So that would be like safe thinking or sound thinking. So thinking above is the first word, sound thinking or safe thinking is the fourth word, the two in the middle, just straight think. So you could translate this verse this way. It could be translated, don't overthink what you ought to think of yourself, but think of yourself in a sound thinking way. That's basically what Paul's saying. And when you see it like that, and when you hear it like that, you're like, Paul really wants me to think about some stuff, right? Like he really wants me to think about some things in a specific way. And so if what we're saying this morning is that engaging in God's calling starts with your thinking and specifically thinking specifically or thinking differently about certain things, the question is, like, what does Paul want us to think about? What is he encouraging us to think differently about in our lives? And he gives us three things in this passage. And the first one is yourself. He's encouraging you to think differently about yourself. He says, you should not think of yourself more highly than you ought. You should think of yourself appropriately. Paul's saying it's way too easy to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think of ourselves. Anybody honest enough to say, yeah, I do that from time to time. I have a very high view of myself. I think I'm wildly important in the world, uh, when in reality, you're not. I mean, maybe to certain people in your life, but like we're not. Like we like to think that we are way more important than we are. If you believe that you are right all the time and you work really hard to let everybody know that you are right all the time, you probably think too highly of yourself, right? If you have this perception that your success in life is due to your own making and nobody else has contributed to it, you probably think too highly of yourself, right? If you find that you are hypercritical of everybody around you so that you can make yourself feel better about yourself, you probably think too highly of yourself. So over the last uh, four months or so, there's a local church in the area that has been blowing up my social media feed. 
Like every time I open up Facebook or Instagram, there's something from this church about what they're doing, about what's coming this Sunday, about how you can engage. And it just got to the point where like, all right, I, I need to check out what's going on at this church. Why am I getting targeted by all of their posts? And so I go, I look at their website, and being a preacher, the first thing I do is I go to their message page, right? Their preaching page where their sermons are. And I start to just scroll through the sermons, and I click on one, and I just start watching one. And it takes 30 seconds, maybe even less than 30 seconds, for me to start criticizing everything about this pastor's sermon, right? He's not engaging enough. I would have said that differently. He should have probably read the scripture here. He should have projected something there. He should have used an image here. And like five minutes in, I'm like, like, what in the world am I doing? Like, here I am criticizing this guy. I've never met him before. I don't know him from Adam. I have no reason to be antagonistic towards him. But I'm criticizing everything he's doing all the while saying, I would do it differently because I would do it better, right? Right? It's so easy to think too highly of ourselves when Paul's saying, you shouldn't, because you're probably not as important as you like to think you are. So what Paul is talking about here, without using the word, is humility. He's talking about humility without actually using the word humility. And sometimes we think that humility is thinking less of ourselves, right? It's having this negative self-perception. But I would say true humility is simply knowing who you are. It's knowing who you are. True humility is being honest with yourself. It's being honest with yourself about your sin, about your weakness, your shortcomings, your failures, your flaws, your need, but also at the same time, As Nate said this morning, it's knowing how much you're loved by God. That these two things simultaneously exist together. That yes, there are things that I do continually to fall short, but simultaneously I am wildly loved and accepted by God. There's a 19th century pastor from New England, a guy named Tyrone Edwards, who said this about humility. He said, true humility is not an abject, groveling, self-despising spirit, but it's a right estimate of ourselves as God sees us. And God is absolutely delighted with you. Not because of your performance, because sometimes your performance, even your spiritual performance, isn't that great. God doesn't love you for the sake of your performance. He loves you because you're his. He loves you because you're his child, and he has given everything to bring you back into his family. And so Paul, if we're saying that engaging in God's calling starts with your thinking, specifically thinking differently about some things, Paul is encouraging us to think differently about ourselves But he's also encouraging us to think differently about to whom you belong. He says this in verse 4. He says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these many members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So Paul here is using a common metaphor to talk about the church, and that metaphor is a human body, that we all, as different parts of the body, make up one complete body. And what he's trying to emphasize with this metaphor is that we as individuals are interconnected and interdependent on each other and how we're called to live. And we each have our own function in the wider community, and we need to know what that function is and operate within that function so that we can all be whole together. So earlier this week, I was moving a couch into my basement, and whenever you move something heavy, what is the phrase people say? Lift with your legs, right? Don't lift with your back. Lift with your legs. So I'm moving this couch down to the basement, lifting with my legs, got it in, and then I was working in my backyard all afternoon. And like, I know that my back 
like cannot take what it could in my 20s, right? I'm feeling it daily. So like all afternoon, I'm trying to be really aware of lifting with my legs, not with my back. And I get through the day, I'm, I'm feeling okay, a little sore. I wake up the next morning and my shoulder is just like, and it's still, I'm like, how did that happen, right? Probably overcompensating or just being neglectful of whatever I was doing with my arm because I was so focused on my back. And what that illustrates is that it's all connected together. Like we all need each part of our body to be functioning and operating in the proper way so that we as a community, not just as individuals, can be whole. And in the same way that that Paul isn't using the word humility to talk about humility, here he's not using the word unity but trying to talk about unity. That we are called to be one in Christ. We live in a hyper-individualistic culture that all revolves around the mindset of me. Like, my responsibility in this culture is to take care of myself, take care of my family, and let everybody else fend for themselves, right? That's the mindset of a hyper-individualistic culture. But Paul is trying to challenge that here. In a sense, he's saying, yeah, sure, you could live that way, You could live with a me mindset and only worry about yourself, but life, he's trying to cast a vision for life, is much better when it's interconnected and interdependent. Because there will come a time in your life when you will have significant need. You'll have great need. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's a physical need or a spiritual need, or even an emotional need, but you will find moments in life when you're like, I need somebody, because I can't do this on my own. And the question is, for those who live with a hyper-individualistic mindset, when you hit that point of need, who are your people? Where do you turn? Who has your back? Who's going to pull you through in those seasons? There's this beautiful picture in Acts 4 of the new community of Christ coming together. Jesus has raised from the dead. He's ascended to the Father. The Spirit has fallen. Just revived the hearts of thousands of people. They're all in Jerusalem, and they're all just staying together, living together, hanging out together. And we read in Acts 4, verse 32, Luke writes, All the believers... We're one in heart and mind. They had this same perspective on the world. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was powerfully at work in all of them. And here's the wild statement in this passage. There was no needy persons among them. All of their needs were met because they lived with this interdependent, interconnected mindset that we are one and we lean into each other and care for each other so that we can help each other through hard times. And Paul is saying this is what it means to be a Christian, to view that our life and what we have, not so much with the mindset of this is mine, but what I have is This is ours, because we are living life in such a way that we are interdependent, we are leaning on each other in our time of need. Because the way that the, the New Testament thinks and discusses and talks about the body of Christ is as a family. It's a spiritual family, that, that we are called to be in this family together. And I realized that family can have a lot of baggage for people, right? Many of us have like families that like, I don't, I could care less about seeing my family. But what the church has is an opportunity to redeem that mindset and that baggage of family for people and to give those without a family an alternative family, a spiritual family. And what Paul is saying all throughout the New Testament, when we operate in that way, like we bear witness to the world for what it means to be 
a follower of Jesus and what it means for God to love us because he's put us in this family that cares for its own and supports one another in hard times. And so Paul is encouraging us and challenging us to think differently about ourselves, to think differently about to whom we belong, and he's also calling us to think differently about what you have to contribute. He says this in verse 6, we have different gifts, we all have different gifts, according to the grace that God has given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so Paul is saying that each part of the body has a different function, has a different purpose, meaning your ears have a different function than your nose, than your tongue, than your hands. Like each part of your body has a different function and a different purpose and does something different for you, which means if he's using this metaphor as a body to describe who we are, we all have a different purpose. We all have a different function that contributes to the greater whole of the body of Christ, and the question is, what is your purpose? Like, what is your function? What is your unique skill set that God has given you? And this might be where, at times, people push back with that fixed mindset. And they, they read that list like, well, if it's prophesy, then prophesy. Or you're like, well, like, I'm not a prophet. Like, that, that seems far-reaching, right? If it's teaching, then teach. Well, I I'm not a teacher. Like, I don't have a biblical degree of any kind. I'm not some sort of professional Christian who's on staff at a church or some Christian nonprofit. Like, it can seem really intimidating when you read some of the things in the scriptures and say, that, that's not me. But some of the most significant giftings that are given to people sometimes can be the simplest and the smallest and can have the greatest impact. I mean, you think of a house, right? And in other parts of the New Testament, Paul will use the metaphor of a house to talk about the church. One of the most significant parts of a house is a key. You gotta have a key to get into the house. And when you compare it to the size of the house, it's super tiny but it could be the most significant part of the house because it's what gives you access to it. Sometimes it's the smallest, most simple, seemingly insignificant giftings that have the biggest impact. So never discount what God has given you. Never discount how God has gifted you because you never know in the right space and in the right time how God will use what he has given you to impact someone else. And so the question is, what has God given you? And the more you engage in God's calling through connecting in community and contributing through serving, the more you experience God at work and the deeper your faith grows. And it's one thing for me to stand up as your pastor and say this to you, right? Like, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? But it's something else to hear from people in the congregation who have found this to be true in their life. And so we put together this week um, a video of some one family who attends church here, and we just wanted to give them a few minutes to describe how connecting in community and contributing through serving has deepened in both their experience in this church and their relationship with the Lord. Go ahead and take a look. I'm Lindsay. I'm Aldo. We have Luciana, who's four, and Leo, who's three. And we're the Martinez family. We've been coming to Meadowbrook for about a year now. Uh, we started coming because we have a lot of friends that love their church, and we wanted to see what it was all about. One of the things that we've really enjoyed about coming to Meadowbrook has been the sense of community that we've gotten, and we've been able to get connected relatively quickly and warmly with a great group of people that have got helped us grow in our faith. Being part of the Harland neighborhood group has really helped us connect and feel a part of the church. Um, 
walking into church every Sunday, seeing people that we know and we appreciate and that our kids know and appreciate and being able to get together and just do life together has been wonderful. One of the ways that I serve here at Meadowbrook is by greeting on Sunday mornings. The reason I decided to be a greeter is it was something that would really work with our schedule, having two young kids, and I also felt like it was something they could help do with me, and it was a way that we could all serve together as a family. Uh, serving has helped me feel a part of Meadowbrook's uh, church family because I'm able to see all the people coming in on Sunday morning, and I'm starting to recognize a lot of faces and making connections just by seeing them as they enter, enter church every Sunday. If you haven't made the decision to uh, serve yet here at Meadowbrook, I would urge you to pray about it, think about it, because um, it's really a great way to get a part of, be a part of the community here. Um, and it's amazing to see the way that God can work through you and around you in those opportunities. For those who haven't stepped into community at Meadowbrook, it really is part of the experience. I think we are, we are called to fellowship and we are called to um, live our faith together in community, um, just like the early church did. I think that's a natural extension of coming in here on, on Sundays and it's been wonderful for us. And so our desire is this. Our desire is that everybody who calls Meadowbrook Church their church home would consider and think about what does it mean for me to really be a part of this church family? Right? If what Paul is saying is that we belong to each other, we are one in Christ, and we all have something to contribute and give to the greater body, what, what is that? How should I engage? Who, who are my people? And what do I have to give? And so as we step into this next year, I've been telling people that I think this year has the potential to be an amazing year for our church. It, because we're coming off of two years that have been just all over the place. And for those last two years, the thing that pastors everywhere have been saying is, I don't know who's in my church. Like, I don't know who's with us. I don't, the, the pandemic has disrupted so many things. But now pastors are starting to say the, the dust is settling. And everywhere, Pastors are saying, like, this has the potential to be an incredible year for our church because we have a sense of who's with us. We have this renewed sense of what the world needs now more than it has ever needed before is hope and a church that's united amidst a divided world to show that there's another way to live. That there's a better way to be in community with people than always be at each other's throats, but to live in a posture of love and care. And we have the opportunity to do that. And so there's some really easy action steps coming out of this morning is that if you're looking for community, we have all sorts of opportunities to engage in community. We have neighborhood communities. You're going to see people wearing blue shirts today that have a neighborhood community logo. You can talk to any one of them and they will tell you all kinds of info about our neighborhood community ministry. There's men's ministries, there's women's ministries, tapestries is starting up this Wednesday, this Wednesday morning and evening Bible study. There's young adult ministry that's happening. There's youth group and all sorts of stuff for, for youth and kids as well. Our, our desire is to be the type of church that lives life together the best that we can. To lean on one another, to share with one another, to understand that we all have something to give. And when we do, we find that we are a more healthy version of what Christ has called us to be and do in this community. We also have a care team where you can just help and serve different needs in our body. If you're thinking, I don't have the opportunity to serve here on Sunday morning, it would be great if you did, but if I can't do that, we have a way for you to just drop off a meal to somebody who's in need, to offer a ride to somebody who needs a ride. And so our hope is, as we step into this next year, that the, the thing that would characterize our church would be love and care, that we would think differently about who we are, about to whom we belong, and what God has given to us to give, not just for the greater good of our church, but also for the community around us. And as we live in that way, God's Spirit would be powerfully at work 
drawing more people, not just to our church, but more importantly, to himself. So may you see that you are a part of something bigger than just yourself. May you know that God has put you here for a very specific reason and that God has gifted you with unique things to contribute to the greater good. And may your eyes be wide open to the things that God is going to do. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the unique way that you have made all of us. Lord, I pray that we would be able to live into what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus through this church. That we would see ourselves as part of a greater whole. That we would view ourselves as one small part in this larger body that has the ability and capacity to love the community around us. And that we would be a bright light for those in need. Help us to think differently about ourselves, about this church, and about what you have given us so that we could be faithful in engaging in your calling and your mission to love the world. We pray this in your name. Amen.